Our goal is to take nuclear waste, turn it into liquid form, separate out materials of value, separate out a form that can go back into reactors. That's about 96% of the waste stream. Picture tossing a foam battery that's still almost full. That's what happens with nuclear fuel. I've reported from salt mines stuffed with radioactive barrels. I've visited permanent dumps built to outlast empires. Then I learned a fact that stopped me cold. When reactors remove fuel rods, more than 90% of the energy is still inside. We run them for only a few years, then guard them for ages. Even stranger, up to 96% of spent fuel can be recycled. So why do most nations refuse to reuse it? To find out, I went to France, the world's recycling heavyweight, the number nobody acts on. France sits near the top of every nuclear chart, but the story starts with a simple, awkward truth. What we call waste is mostly unused fuel. In many reactors, the same uranium assemblies stay inside for about three to five years. Utilities pull them out because the chain reaction gets harder to control, not because the fuel is empty. Those rods are still hot, still radioactive, and still packed with potential. Yet in most countries, they are treated like a dead end. They are moved to pools, then to dry storage, and then they wait for a final burial plan that may not exist yet. When you do the math, it feels absurd. Over 90% of the energy remains, and only a few percent is truly unrecoverable. In France, engineers talk about spent fuel the way miners talk about ore. They see uranium and plutonium locked inside, plus a smaller slice of nasty byproducts. That mindset changes everything. It turns a disposal problem into a supply chain. It also raises scary questions about security, cost, and trust. If recycling is so powerful, why isn't everyone doing it? The answer is not one thing. It is a chain of practical barriers, and France is the best place to watch them up close, a maze built for radioactivity. The trip takes you five hours from Paris to the far western coast, where Arano runs France's main recycling site. The facility is huge, and much of it is underground. A longtime worker named Sylvain Renouf calls it a maze with roughly 24,000 rooms. Before you cross into the nuclear area, you dress for the rules. You wear protective gear that stays behind if contamination is detected. You clip on a dosimeter, a small device that will beep if radiation levels rise. Then you meet the first star of the process, the transport cask. It looks like a metal capsule from a sci-fi film, but it is real. One loaded cask can weigh around 110 tons. That weight is the shield. Inside, the fuel can sit at roughly 2 to 300 degrees Celsius, still releasing heat. Stand close enough, and you might even feel it, yet the steel keeps you safe from the radiation. Orano unloads about one cask a day, with more waiting in line. The fuel rods are lifted out inside sealed chambers, using remote machines, controlled from a separate room. Most fuel is French now, but contracts have included the Netherlands and Australia, and recycled fuel goes to Japan. Humans think. Robots do the touching. Once the assemblies are out, they ride to the next stop, and the plant shifts from transport to patients. Cooling pools and a different mindset. The cooling pools are the place that makes your stomach flip. You are suddenly very close to a lot of used fuel, and your brain screams that this should be impossible. Down in the water, baskets hold fuel assemblies like giant racks. Above them sits about four meters of water, which acts as a simple and powerful shield. The room feels calm, almost ordinary, until you remember what is resting below. Many visitors feel lightheaded at first. Workers do not. They have learned to trust the layers of protection. The fuel stays here for five to seven years because time is the cheapest coolant. As radioactive isotopes decay, the heat and radiation drop, and the assemblies become manageable for the chemical steps. This is where the philosophical split becomes clear. In many countries, the pool is just a waiting room on the way to disposal. In France, it is an inventory. Sylvain calls it a uranium and plutonium mine, a strategic resource for the country and for customers. He points out the headline number again. Roughly 96% of what sits in the pool can be recycled. That is a huge amount of energy, but numbers alone do not win. To see why, you need to understand what spent really means inside a reactor. 
Why fuel becomes spent so fast? A nuclear reactor is basically a controlled chain reaction that turns atomic splits into heat. One isotope, uranium-235, loves to fission. When a neutron hits it, the atom breaks apart, releases energy, and throws off more neutrons. Those neutrons strike other atoms, and the cycle continues. The reactor core heats up, water turns to steam, steam spins a turbine, and electricity is born. The catch is what fission leaves behind. Each split creates fission products, new elements that do not help the chain reaction. Many of them absorb neutrons instead. Over a few years, they build up like ash in a fireplace. The chain reaction weakens, control becomes harder, and operators swap the fuel out. Physics, not politics, sets that limit for today's most common reactors. After removal, the rod still contains lots of uranium that barely fissions in that design, plus plutonium that formed inside the core, plus the fission products. Other reactor concepts could squeeze far more energy from the same material, including designs that breed new fuel or burn different mixes. But many of those systems are still experimental, expensive, and complex to build and run. So for now, most of the world parks its used fuel and calls it waste, even though it is more like a half-used resource with a long, dangerous afterlife, separating the treasure from the trouble. After cooling, the assemblies move into areas that look quiet from the outside and intense on the inside. The chemical process runs in sealed, hot cells with no windows. Operators rely on sensors, and when inspections are needed, robots or drones can go in. First, machines cut away the metal cladding from the fuel pellets. Then, the fuel is dissolved in nitric acid. A solvent step pulls uranium and plutonium into one stream, leaving the fission products behind. Another chemical change shifts plutonium into a different state, so it can be separated from uranium. The ugly truth is that about 4% of the material is not recyclable. Those are the fission products, and they will remain highly radioactive. The good news is that the uranium stream can be reused in conventional plants instead of mining fresh uranium. Then there is plutonium. Gram for gram, it carries staggering energy. One gram is often compared to about a metric ton of oil in energy potential. But plutonium also carries fear. It can be used to make nuclear weapons, and history has proven that civilian material can be misused. In the 1970s, India extracted plutonium from a reactor and used it for a weapons test. According to former US regulator Alison McFarlane, that shock pushed the United States to defer large-scale reprocessing to reduce proliferation risk. France chose a different path, with heavy security and strict accounting. Orano ships purified plutonium under secrecy with armed escort to be blended with uranium into Emox fuel. MOX can cut fresh uranium needs by roughly 30%, and in France it supplies around 10% of the nation's electricity. Glass, money, and the limits of recycling. Even after uranium and plutonium are recovered, the hardest leftovers remain. France deals with them through vitrification, trapping fission products inside molten glass. The glass cools into solid forms sealed in steel canisters. In storage halls, those canisters sit stacked in deep pits under floors that can be about two meters thick. The space savings are real. France can store one year of high-level waste from a whole nuclear program in a compact layout, and without recycling, it would need roughly five times more room for the same electricity. What recycling does not change is the timeline. The dangerous isotopes still take very long periods to decay, so a final deep geological storage site is still required. France plans such a facility, but until then, the canisters keep accumulating. Then comes the main reason most countries hesitate. Cost. The plant itself, security, special transport casks, remote machinery, and chemical systems are expensive. Buying uranium, using it once, and storing the spent fuel is often cheaper, because uranium is still relatively abundant. Reprocessing also creates extra waste from chemicals, filters, tools, and contaminated equipment. And today, MOX fuel is usually not recycled again, so it becomes waste after another run. That is why only a few players reprocess at scale. 
France, Russia at a smaller level, India and China's early facilities. The UK stopped, Japan has struggled with decades of delays, and many nations never started. Researchers are exploring alternatives like pyroprocessing, which uses molten salts and high heat and does not separate pure plutonium, lowering weapons risk. But it is still experimental, and no one knows what it will cost at scale. So nuclear recycling stays a trade-off, less fresh mining and less volume, but more complexity, more expense, and no escape from long-term storage. So the crazy fact is real. We discard fuel that still holds huge energy. France shows you can recover most of it, turning spent rods into new MOX fuel and locking the rest into glass. But the bill is high, security is non-stop, and even recycling cannot erase the need for deep burial. For many nations, it is still cheaper to store the rods and move on. Maybe new reactors or new chemistry will change the math. Until then, nuclear waste is both a danger and a resource. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. New videos arrive every Friday, so don't miss them.